Hey everybody, this is Russ Altman from The Future of Everything. Almost everybody knows somebody who has battled cancer. Today on The Future of Everything, we're rerunning our episode with Professor Jennifer Cochran, who is bringing some hope in this area through work she and her lab are doing to find ways to localize therapies directly to the site of cancer tumors for more efficient and effective treatment. You won't want to miss this one. It's full of inspiring insights that will hopefully move us towards a future of improved outcomes for cancer patients. Before we jump into this episode, a reminder to please rate and review the podcast. It'll help our audience grow and it'll help us improve. So almost everyone knows somebody who has battled cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, the list goes on. Actually, most organs within the human body are associated with some type of cancer where the cells from that organ grow out of control and in the worst case metastasize or spread to another part of the body, breaking off from the original tissue and wreaking havoc on normal physiology. And many of us know stories about this terrible disease. Cancer treatment for many years has relied on three interventions. Number one is surgery. We take out the cancer. We go in there. We're always worried, however, that we've left some behind, that, that the surgeon in the surgical operating theater has gotten most of it, but there might have been a little bit left, or there might be very early metastases and even in other parts of the body that weren't even part of the surgery. And so you're worried that it didn't get the whole thing. The second treatment has been radiation. We know that we can kill cells by exposing them to what we call ionizing radiation, such as x-rays. And so we beam the radiation, usually very precisely, at the cancer to kill the cancer cells, and it often kills some of the surrounding tissue. That's a downside. But we have the same worries. We worry that we didn't kill all the cells, that there might be some left around the edges that we missed, or that there are metastases that we missed, and therefore it's not the whole story. And then the third element is chemotherapy, as we call it. We give these very powerful drugs that kill cells, uh, mostly cells that are rapidly dividing. Now, cancer cells grow rapidly, more rapidly than most normal cells. And so chemicals that preferentially cause problems with a growing cell can kill cancer cells effectively. However, they often have side effects, usually GI, a gastrointestinal upset and hair loss because the cells in your gut and the cells in your hair follicles are also rapidly growing and so like the cancer cells, they suffer. Now, the benefits of chemotherapy is that it should hit any cancer anywhere in the body. So I mentioned metastases is always a worry. And when you give a systematic medication, you're getting it throughout the whole body. And so it should be able to capture and treat cancer cells no matter where they are. But it is very toxic in the same way that it spreads throughout the whole body for the metastases. It also spreads throughout the whole body and causes significant side effects and even long-term problems with the normal cells that are being poisoned. And of course, you can sometimes develop resistance to chemotherapy. The cells that are not killed by the chemotherapy often develop a tolerance for it so that if you come back with the same treatment, it's just not going to work on those cells. They've figured out how to avoid it. Now, the last few years have brought some extremely exciting new ways to think about cancer treatment. And it combines some of the targeted features of surgery and radiation with some of the general killing capabilities of chemotherapy. These new therapies take advantage of our increased understanding of biology. That's the whole point, is by understanding the mechanisms of the cancer, you can understand ways to conquer it. And we can understand how cancer cells harness the machinery of the normal cell to grow and spread. Some examples of how these therapies rely on some new tricks might include one, we are blocking the ability of the cancer cell to make nutrients that it relies on to grow. When you're a rapidly dividing cell, you need nutrients. You need sugar. You need all the normal things that any living system needs. And sometimes we find that the cancer cells are particularly prone to starvation, so to speak, if we can knock out certain parts of their machinery. Second, we might be able to block the ability of cancer cells to send signals. A lot of cellular biology is about signaling, it's telling the cell to turn things on, turn things off. And often cancer cells hijack these signals and use them to promote their growth. We can develop molecules that block this signaling in a very specific way and therefore shut down the cancer. 
we can develop antibodies. Antibodies are the molecules in your body that attack foreign substances in order to kind of clear them from the body. They are often used for like bacterial infections. We can often develop antibodies to block critical biological functions like the growth of new blood vessels. Cancer cells need to get blood supplies just like every other cell, and they promote the growth of these uh, blood vessels. And if we can block that growth, we can kill the cancer. And finally, and a very hot area of cancer therapy right now is so-called immuno-oncology. Can we develop molecules that stimulate our own immune system to attack the cancer the same way that it attacks bacterial infections or viral infections? And there's been some intriguing initial reports that shows that this may be a very fruitful way to combat cancer. So it's a very exciting time. My guest today is Dr. Jennifer Cochran professor and chair of the bioengineering department at Stanford University. Jennifer, you have developed what has been called guided chemotherapy missiles in your work. What are the missiles and how do you guide them? You mentioned all of the components that we currently have in our arsenal to treat cancer. However, as you also mentioned, there are a lot of limitations. And so how do we best combine these technologies to get a balance of safety and efficacy for the patient. And so we and others are very interested in how we can localize therapy to the site of the, the tumor where it's needed. And as you mentioned, antibodies and other proteins that can target tumors are, are one way to do this. And so cancer cells actually put on their surface these receptors that act like antenna, and they survey signals from the environment that tell them to grow and to divide. And we actually can use these receptor antennas as a localization handle. And these are somewhat specific to the cancer cells? Right. Well, not 100%, but they're more highly expressed on right. the cancer cell compared to healthy tissue. And so you're playing a numbers game in trying to use them to localize things to tumors. And what we and others have done is developed novel proteins that can selectively or mostly selectively target these cancer cells, and then we can attach cargo to them. Ah, uh, this is where the missile analogy comes right. from. Right, exactly. And so the cargo that we attach are things like chemotherapy, which can then selectively be targeted to the tumor, and the idea is that you can deliver something that's more poisonous then you would be able to deliver systemically. And as you mentioned, chemotherapy can really wreak havoc on healthy dividing cells. And yes. so it's just you get systemic um, effects from regular chemotherapy. So this takes what would have been a systemic drug and makes it much more targeted. You can probably even give it in higher doses locally than you could give if you were giving it to the entire body. Absolutely. So these proteins that you've evolved or that you've created to... Um, find these special antenna on the cancer cells. How do they work? There are antibodies that naturally occur in our bodies, and the pharma industry has harnessed this to create antibodies that selectively can target tumors. Now, in my lab at Stanford, we take a slightly different approach where we use alternatives to antibodies. So as amazing as antibodies are, they can have some limitations in that they are very large in terms of molecular size. And so they have trouble wiggling into a tumor. And so what we've done is we created smaller versions of tumor targeting proteins that can hopefully penetrate into tumors better. And what we've done is then chemically attach chemotherapy molecules to them to deliver a punch to the cancer cells. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, and we're talking to Jennifer Cochran about chemotherapy guided missiles and alternatives to antibodies that are smaller, might penetrate the cancer uh, more deeply. Where do those come from? Who dreamt those up? And uh, why doesn't our body use those? They sound great. Well, there's this whole field of research and technology called directed evolution, where we can take natural proteins or we can create new proteins that aren't currently found in nature. And we can basically develop designer proteins, if you will, that can fill very unique roles in 
targeted therapy. So I, I think it is worth taking a second to understand because you use this very interesting term, directed evolution, and mm-hmm. that you know people have a rough idea of evolution. It's uh, it's the Darwinian theory that uh, there's um, mutation and then selection, and that's how life on Earth has developed. Um, but the word directed is funny because we think of evolution as a forward-going process where you know just whatever happens happens. So can you take us through what it would mean to take this idea of evolution, which is mutation and selection, but then this idea of having a goal? Because I don't think of evolution usually as having a goal. How can you do that, and how do these proteins kind of emerge? So molecular engineers can harness the evolution process, and we can basically drive it in a test tube. And what this means is that instead of taking millions of years for something to evolve to have favorable properties, we can make that happen in a matter of of weeks in a test tube on a lab bench. Does it still involve mutation and selection? It does. So what we do is we take the DNA sequence, which codes for amino acids of a protein, and we intentionally create mutations in that DNA sequence. And what we do is we create libraries of hundreds of millions of protein variants. And then we have a way to rapidly express and test those proteins. To And we challenge them just like they would be challenged. So this is like the selection process. Right. Survival of the fittest with molecules, basically. Got it. And what you're – and so what's – the, I get it. So the direction is the fact that you say, I want you to bind this – target in the same way a monoclonal or an antibody might bind it. And so in some sense, you're putting pressure on this system to say, of all of these hundreds of millions of proteins, the only one I'm going to allow to survive in the lab are the ones that show a high binding uh, capability to my target of interest. Absolutely. And that works. It it works. And it worked beautifully. And and in the example we were just discussing, we took a peptide, which is a small fragment of a protein, and we ran it through this process. And this peptide came from the seeds of the squirting cucumber, of all things. The squirting cucumber. You heard it here first. <laughs> so we the picked seeds of the, the seeds squirting. of the squirting cucumber. So evolutionarily, plants have evolved mechanisms that allow their propagation. And this particular peptide is an enzyme inhibitor. And what that does is it shuts down enzymes that would naturally degrade things. And it really has nothing to do with cancer, but it has all to do with making the molecule very favorable as a drug scaffold or drug lead. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to take those favorable properties and actually turn this protein into a tumor targeting agent. And that's what we as molecular engineers do. Got it. And so we ran this squash-derived protein through this evolution process to create the tumor targeting protein that we then hooked the chemotherapy agents onto. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Jennifer Cochran about uh, her ability to accelerate evolution by millions, if not trillions, what the heck, of years uh, to get proteins that used to be part of a cucumber or a squash, it's become a little bit unclear in the last couple of seconds, and turn that into a, a chemotherapy agent. So uh, I, I think we got you there. So, so so far we have this molecule that we took from the squash. We, uh, um, we mutated it. We put incredible pressure on it to bind a target, and then it does. Now, what is that target's role in the cancer, and why is it useful? Or is it simply just the antenna that we're going to tag on so that we can bring the payload, as you called it, or the cargo uh, before? Right. So these particular receptors that we're targeting are cell adhesion receptors that the cancer uses to grow, divide, migrate, proliferate. And so these Lots are... Lots of the bad things yeah, that cancer right, do. Exactly. These are the mechanisms that cancer has evolved to you know, evade all of, all of our natural defenses. And so what we wanted to do was to use these as a handle. Now, previously, people had tried to use these particular molecules and just block the cell signaling that drives these processes, but that really wasn't very effective. However, we reasoned that we could leverage several decades' worth of clinical research to now teach an old target new tricks in a sense of where we were going to use these cell adhesion proteins to localize things to tumors. And we've done that with the chemotherapy, but we've also more recently done that with immunotherapy as well. So I want to get to immunotherapy, but before we (laughs) move on, tell me how far this has gone. So this idea sounds great. Is this something that we're still thinking about that works great in mice, or is there any evidence that people with cancer can actually be seeing this in the near future? There are several molecules from drug companies that are currently in patients right now, and more to come. There's a lot in the pipeline. There have been some challenges in the field with 
effectively targeting things to tumors and not having the drug molecule fall off as these things are circulating in the yeah, body. Yeah, so it, it, when you do have that cargo or payload, you have to unload it. Exactly. And if it's stuck to some big molecule, it might not be able to enter the cell and do its thing. Or it might unload prematurely and then give you the toxic side effects we were just trying to avoid. And so there's actually a lot of engineering that is going into it and still needs to be done on, on how we could play with the parts, if you will, to develop more effective approaches for targeted chemotherapy. But people are making a lot of advances. And some of these targeted therapies are in humans, in right. trials, I would presume? Actually, there are two molecules that are currently FDA approved. Great. Now, let's move on to, um, you, you mentioned Im immunology, and I mentioned it in my introduction. There's really been this renaissance of realizing that one of our best allies in the fight against cancer may be our own immune system, which has been, of course, through human evolution, has been exquisitely refined to do certain things, mostly about infectious diseases, and but can be harnessed also for treating cancer. Can you kind of lay out for us what the opportunity is here and then where your work is kind of focusing? Right. So you mentioned immunotherapy, and it really is a pretty amazing time in the space because now we're a actually able to make really significant advances in disease progression-free survival in patients with immunotherapy. And what this means is that we can actually recruit the body's own defenses to attack the cancer. And the chemotherapy, you still have the resistance that occurs. And so while that is delaying things and the immunotherapy actually now gives you a chance to potentially cure. And the results that have been seen in late stage patients have been pretty amazing when you're actually now juicing up the immune system. How do you get an immune system to attack cells that are derived from the body that the immune system is normally held within? All of us have tumor cells that are circulating in our body and our cancer Wait, we do? We do, right. And our body normally That's a headline. I know. Our our body does a really good job typically at fighting them off. And it's when that balance shifts is, is there's there's a problem. And, and really, cancer cells are sneaky, and they've evolved mechanisms that allow them to be evaded by our immune systems. And so the, current, the therapies that are on the market now are the ones that basically uncloak the tumor cell from the immune system and allow it to attack. And so you're basically taking the cloak off or taking the brakes off and unleashing the immune system. And in some cases, that can be quite transformative. We were just about to discuss some of the ideas that your lab has about contributing to this kind of revolution in using immune system to battle cancer. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're thinking? Sure. So we talked about the targeted chemotherapy. We've also used the technology to light tumors up as well. And so we initially were able to visualize the tumors. And so that led us down a path of if we can see the tumors, we can deliver chemotherapy and other drugs to it. But then around that time, my colleague at MIT, Dane Wittrip, was studying novel ways to turn on or activate the immune system. And he was searching for a tumor targeting molecule that could be used across many cancers and, and fill some of the properties we were discussing. And we decided to team up several years ago where we were now combining our tumor targeting technology with his insights into immunotherapy. Yes. And working together, we were able to find a way to stimulate multiple factors of the immune system. So the immune system is basically like an orchestra, and there's many different musicians in the orchestra that need to work together in, in order to get a final beautiful piece of music. And so by using our tumor targeting molecule with some of the things that make the immune system work better, we've been able to actually get a one-two punch and um, activate the immune system to more effectively attack cancer. And when you say activate the immune system, this is in the local region of the cancer. So you're not creating a global, I think ideally, you're not creating a global immune response, which might make somebody feel very sick, like they have a really bad flu. But I would guess that the response is most brisk and most active just in the area where you've targeted your, your molecules. Is that true? That's partially true, although we are awakening things in, in immune active areas of the body, such as the lymph nodes, for example. And so there does, there are components of elsewhere in the body that are required for this. But we're targeting things to the tumor and then bringing actually immune cells into the tumor where they then can start to act upon the cancer cells. Is our understanding of immunology sufficient to know exactly how to mess with that orchestra? Because you're right, it is an orchestra. And from those of us who've even taken a brief look at it, it's an incredibly complex orchestra. So just adding a cello or taking away a bass might not do it. So how do you marry modern understanding of immunology with this whole attempt to 
defeat the cancer. We've done some pretty amazing things so far, but still is in the early stages. And it's a little bit like the Wild West in the sense that we're just trying things. And, and that's actually pretty unique time in, in, in terms of science and, and clinical development, where if you look at the number of clinical trials that are in patients using combinations of different immunotherapies to look at them, how they work together, there are something like 1,600 combination trials going on right oh. now, which is pretty amazing. So we're, we're almost basically doing these things on the fly and hoping to learn a lot about them so that we can accelerate progress in the area. It's very interesting because it, it highlights two contrasts. You could sit and study something forever until you know the answer, but you can also do some empirical things that seem reasonable. And the combination of empiricism plus some theory might get us to a solution more quickly. Right, especially since cancer patients are waiting yes. for the results. Now, are these immunotherapies, it's always the same question, are these immunotherapies going to be available or are available to patients today, or is this something we should look forward to? There are a number of molecules that are FDA approved, and you might have heard commercials for them on TV. And the thing that many people might not realize is that they only actually work for a subset of patients. And so the question is, how do we make them work better for a larger subset of patients? And what we're trying to do is to make immunotherapy accessible to a broader range of patients by creating new approaches, but then also creating approaches that make the current therapies work better. Now, you described this great story about how you took your technology and married it with your collaborator. Are there other examples, perhaps not even in the area of cancer, where the kinds of technologies you've developed might hook up to create new treatments or new diagnostics for entirely different areas of health? So the approaches that we've been talking about, they do have a lot of parallels in other diseases, and we've been applying them for cancer, but there isn't any reason why you couldn't use the same approach to deliver therapies to, to other types of disease tissue. And we and others are actively exploring that. We've only really just scratched the surface of what we can do in the area. And I would say that a big driver of this has been the interdisciplinary culture at Stanford. So Stanford has a deep-rooted culture of collaborative research. And so we've enjoyed the privilege of working with physicians, clinicians, scientists, engineers, and physicists, all really working together to tackle really challenging problems. You know, this is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, and I'm speaking with Dr. Jennifer Cochran about cancer and the interdisciplinary challenges of putting together teams that can understand directed evolution, protein engineering, immunology, cancer, not to mention the physics, the material sciences. So whenever I hear about such complicated teams, it almost always turns into a language problem. Yes, we all speak English, but the specific technical languages spoken by those different specialists are very different, and they, are, they stem from the results of many years of training. How do you start talking to somebody in a new field when you, although you share English, most of the commonalities end there? Well, the key is just everybody has to have a motivation to be willing to come to the table and learn. And part of that communication is actually the fun part, because then you really get to learn about other approaches people are working on that, that could help solve your problem that you weren't even thinking about. And really, these teams of scientists and engineers and clinicians are moving the needle. And I, I think that in order to work on impactful problems, we need to move even more into the era of where science is a team sport. So how do you decide when it's time to take something out of the laboratory and turn it into a company or sell it to a company that knows how to make large-scale drugs, knows how, has, a, has a, a dissemination pathway for getting it out to the doctors and the clinics. You know, there's always a question of you do the discovery in the university lab, and then you do the experiments to prove that this really is promising, and then maybe you do some animals. And then the question is, should I be the one doing the first human studies, or should I now bring in a partner? It kind of falls under the previous discussion about these teams. When is it time to bring an industrial partner into the team? That's a great question. So in, in academia, we have obviously limited resources and bandwidth, and we can also only take something so far. And in order to actually develop a drug for patients, it takes quite a bit of money and quite a bit of know-how to do that. And so there's this what's called a valley of death where you can... That doesn't sound good. <laughs> no, you, can, you, you basically have this project, and it's really exciting, and then how do you actually take it to the next level? And for me... Two years ago, I actually took a leave of absence from Stanford to do just that with some of these technologies we've been discussing. So I really wanted to be able to see the other side of it and to learn actually what it 
takes to get something to that next level. And so we did this. We started some companies and we're moving this technology forward. And we're now positioning it to move into humans, which so is what very makes, exciting. So what makes it a valley of death? So mm -hmm. if things, of course, if things don't go well, if your experiments don't w work, it is death because nobody's going to. But if your experiments look good and if the experiments in the lab and in the, maybe in the animals have been promising, what is the challenge to make it a valley of death and not just a simple phone call to your local industrial titan saying, hey, we have something that I think really can help patients. It's time for you guys to take over. Paint the picture for why it becomes such a challenge. Right. Well, we do amazing science and we pub publish this in high impact journals. But what you might not realize is that in order to actually turn it into a drug, you need to do things like manufacturing and you need to do regulatory studies looking at you know, tox profiles and, and within, With within the that, FDA, for example. FDA and, and that's a very time consuming and expensive process and it requires a lot of expertise. So the challenge is actually where do the resources come from, first of all, but then also pharma companies have a lot of things in their own pipelines and they ah. might not be as amenable to taking a risk on something you that wasn't invented. You need to win invented. their love. Exactly. And they've already loving some of their internal projects. Right. And so you could get there, but sometimes you might, you might need just a little bit of nudge to actually get it on the path where a pharma company would be interested. So it's very exciting to hear about an academic who actually went out and took a couple of years in industry and then came back. In other words, it wasn't a one-way trip where you said sayonara, Russ, and my academic friends, but you came back. Is that going to inform how you do your research in a substantial way going forward? Absolutely. So a big focus of my lab is developing therapeutic candidates for treating things like cancer. And I really wanted to be able to walk the walk. So I'm talking the talk that we're making drugs, but I wanted to be able to actually have that experience. And I have to say, having that experience has made my research that much better. And now we can incorporate what we've learned into the early design stage to help make sure that we can achieve our goal down the road. You know the questions that they're going to ask because you were asking those very questions. And so you can answer them and hopefully that valley of death is narrowed or removed so that the translation from the bench to the bedside to the ultimate benefit of patients is more facile. Absolutely. And I would love to help enable others at Stanford and, and elsewhere to do that. You have been listening to the Future of Everything podcast with Russ Altman. I want to remind you that the Future of Everything started out as a radio show on Sirius XM. So you'll hear references to that. Now it is a 100% podcast, but we still have access to the great shows that we taped with Sirius XM. There are more than 215 of them, and they cover an extraordinary range of topics. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider subscribing or following so that you can be alerted to every new episode and never be surprised by the future. Maybe tell your friends about it too. Definitely consider rating and reviewing it. That helps us grow, improve, and also spreads the word. You can connect with me on Twitter at RBAltman and with Stanford Engineering at Stanford ENG.